is. We thank you for joining us. We invite you to join us for virtual Bible study on Tuesday nights at 7 p.m. and Sundays at 10.55 a.m. for virtual Sunday service. Like, comment, and subscribe on YouTube and Facebook to watch all of our services online. If you are visiting and looking for a church home, Join the CAP VBC family. Email info at capvbc.org for more information. Good morning. For the Lord is in his holy temple, let all the earth keep silence before him. We will begin our morning worship service as we join together in singing him 651. Praise God from whom all blessings flow following now. Prayer of invocation. Let us pray. Eternal Heavenly Father, we thank thee for this day. Thank you, Lord God, for having brought us to this appointed place and appointed time once more and again. We come, Lord God, on one accord, and that is to lift the name of Jesus, for he's worthy to be praised. So we pray, Lord God, as we go through this worship service, that all that's said and done herein will be pleasing in thy sight. Into thine hands we commend these, thy people, body, soul, and spirit, for Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. reading, let us turn to selection 43 in the African American Heritage Hymnal, selection 43, Reconciliation, and we will read that A column, the Old Testament column, selection 43, Reconciliation in African American Hymnal, A column. Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, I will kill my brother Jacob. Then as he called Jacob and blessed him and charged him, go at once to Padam Aram, to the house of Bethuel, and take his wife from there, one of the daughters of Laban. May God Almighty bless you and make you fruitful and numerous. May he give to you the blessing of Abraham, to you and to your offspring. Thus Isaac sent Jacob away, and he went to Paddan Aram. Jacob said to Laban, These twenty years I have been in your house. I served you fourteen years for your two daughters, and six years for your flock. God saw my affliction and the labor of my hands. Jacob sent messengers before him to his brother Esau, instructing them Thus you shall say to my lord Esau, Thus says your servant Jacob, I have lived with Laban as an alien and stayed until now. And I have oxen, donkeys, flocks, male and female slaves, in order that I may find favor in your sight. The messengers returned to Jacob, saying, We came to your brother Esau, and he is coming to meet you, and four hundred men are with him. Then Jacob was greatly afraid and distressed. 
Now Jacob looked up and saw Esau coming, and 400 men with him. He himself went on ahead of them, bowing himself to the ground seven times until he came near his brothers. But Esau, Esau ran, ran to meet him and, and embraced, embraced him, him and fell on, and fell his, on neck, his neck and kissed, kissed him, him and they wept. wept. Let us join together in singing him 500. We're marching to Zion. Marching to Zion, the beautiful city of Zion. Our devotional scripture this morning is taken from the New Testament, book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, uh, verses 14 through 21. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5. Verses 14 through 21, we'll be reading from the New International Version. New International Version, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 through 21. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, therefore died. And he died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. So from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ 
and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting in people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Let us pray. Most holy and everlasting thou art God, we come once again uh, at this appointed place, at this appointed time, praying for the sick, the shedding, and bereaved, whomever and wherever they may be. There's a lot of sickness, a lot of devastation and despair, not only in our community, but across the face of the earth. So we come, Lord God, imploring you, who sits high, high and looks low, you who uh, created the, the sun, the moon, and the stars, indeed you who uh, allow the earthquakes and the tsunamis and so forth to come forth. We come, Lord God, praying that your healing power your generative, regenerative power, your empowering power would come and dwell in our midst. We pray, Lord God, uh, that uh, you will continue, Lord God, to uh, forgive us as we have forgiven those who have trespassed against us. We cannot thank you, Lord God, enough. But we had a thousand, thousand tongues. We could not thank you enough for each of us come saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for the air we breathe and the water we eat, movement in our limbs, sight in our eyes, hearing in our ears, taste on our tongue, swallowing in our throat, uh, breath in our nostrils, in our lungs. We thank you, Lord God. We pray, Lord God, that the sick, whomever and wherever they may be, some in her, uh, home, nursing homes, uh, some in hospices, some uh, sick beds within the home, some not having a home or hospice or hospital or whatever to go to, some are lying on grates and alleys of the streets, but wherever the sick may be, you see all, Lord God. You have all power, heaven and earth in your hands. And we pray, Lord God, that you would reach out and touch to the end that we would be healed. We can do nothing without you, but all things are possible with you. We pray for the shutting, those who are not as mobile they would desire, or as they would used to be. We pray, Lord God, that you continue to bless and comfort them, that they would appreciate uh, that they still, uh, though they're not able to move physically, uh, they can move mentally and spiritually and be seated in your throne room above. We pray for the bereaved, those who recently lost loved ones, they too would be confident and encouraged that we would confident and encourage one another, being mindful that one day each of us will have to give account for the deeds done in this body. We pray for Captain View Baptist Church, Lord God, that you will continue to keep us in the hollow of thy hand, that you will continue to guide us and direct us according to your will. These blessings we ask in Jesus' name, for his sake. Amen. We will continue as we join together in singing. M 160, the Lord is my light.
right, right. And now come to the part of the worship service in which everyone can participate. That is the offering time. Amen. The Bible says that the Lord loves a hilarious giver. Amen. So let us give hilariously. Not as though God is a joke, but because God has been good to us. And God has been far better to us than we could ever uh, be to ourselves. And as I say from Sunday after Sunday, though we do not have a physical plant, our desire is to get back into the real world while we're able to maintain a virtual ministry. The virtual ministry costs money, and the real world ministry costs money. So we ask that you would give, not grudgingly, no out of necessity, but give willingly, cheerfully, hilariously, as God has been blessing you. Uh, don't give as the world gives, but give as Christ gives. Amen. Uh, you can donate to uh, going to the church's website, PayPal. As I say, Sunday after Sunday, we're going to get there. We're going to get some other mechanisms for giving uh, through uh, the Internet or through the, however you describe it, electronically. But in the meantime, you can always mail your offering to Capital View Baptist Church, 2490 Market Street, Northeast, Unit 422, Washington, D.C., 20018. Or you can reach out to me. I'll come meet you somewhere and receive your donation and give you my personal thanks. And so we're going to call, ask Elder John Fowler to come at, that, at this time and lead us in our offertory prayer. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank thee for this day. We thank you for waking us up this morning in our right frames of minds with a reasonable portion of health and strength. We thank you for the jobs that you've given us and the modes of transportation that you've given us to get to and fro from our jobs. We now come, Lord, bringing back a portion of our earnings to your house. We ask that you bless this offering, that you purify to make it whole, and that it's used to the uplifting of your kingdom. In the precious and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord. Amen. Thank you, each and every one, for your continued giving. We'll now continue with our worship service as we uh, sing our anthem, Deliver Me. He leads me beside still waters. He restoreth my soul. When you become a believer, your spirit is made right. And sometimes, the soul doesn't get the notice. It has a hole in it due to things that's happened in the past, hurt, abuse, molestation. But we want to speak to you today and tell you that God wants to heal the hole in your soul. Some people's actions are not because their spirit is wrong, but it's because the past has left a hole in their soul. May this wisdom help you get over your past and remind you that God wants to heal the hole in your soul. I have my sister Leandria here. She's going to help me share this wisdom and tell this story. Cause all I seem to do is hurt me Hurt me Lord, deliver me Cause all I seem to do is hurt me. 
if you're listening out there, just repeat after me if you're struggling with your past and say, Let the Lord know. Just say, Oh. He wants to restore your soul. Seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. I will hear from heaven. Break it on down. So it is. It is so. Amen. Now when we pray, we want to end that with a declaration, a decree. So I'm speaking for all of you listening, starting here, starting now. The things that hurt you in the past won't control your future. Starting now, this is a new day. This is your exodus. You are officially really. Now sing it for me, Leandria. meditation hymn, which will follow our meditation prayer, we shall sing hymn 377, It is well with my soul. Let each of us turn our hearts heavenward as we prepare to talk with the Lord in our respective tent doors, as we care, share with him our cares, our concerns, the desires of our hearts. Eternal Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise thee for being God and God all by yourself and for your continued blessings upon us. We come now, Lord God, a disappointed place with disappointed time <clears throat> as we prepare to partake of your preached word. We pray that as your seed word goes forth, it will find large within each of our souls. Sinking deep within us, a tree planted by the rivers of water, bringing forth fruit in each of our lives, fit for the cause and kingdom of Jesus Christ. 160, 30 fold. We pray for the preacher that he be dipped down into your well of wisdom, and that through uh, the Holy Spirit, through you, the Holy Spirit be put out upon us, such that when we leave this place, we'll say, Did not our hearts burn within? The man of God spoke with us along the way. These and all blessings we ask in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen. Hymn 377 is well. I'm sorry. Hymn 377 is well with myself. Yes.
read in your hearing for this morning's devotional scripture, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through, I'm sorry, verses 14 through 21. We're going to return now to New International Version and read that 19th verse, which reads that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. Today's title, In Christ God Reconciled the World to Himself. Again, today's title, In Christ God Reconciled the World to Himself. In today's sermon, we'll briefly touch upon four biblical doctrines. Doctrine of covenant, of the covenant of Mount Sinai, or the marriage covenant between God and Israel. The doctrine of the substitutionary atonement. The doctrine of justification. And the doctrine of reconciliation. In doing so, it is our desire that we each be found uh, on our respective way to being found workmen who need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word. We we'll begin with the world. In order to stand, properly understand each of these four doctrines, as I've outlined, the doctrine of the covenant of Mount Sinai, the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement, uh, the doctrine of reconciliation, uh, we need to understand the context, which is the world. It's often been said that confession is good for the soul. Indeed, uh, James 5, 6 says, confess your faults one to another. So I begin with uh, confessing that the overwhelming majority of my life, I and those who preceded me and those who have come along with me have been misapplying or misunderstanding the term the world as it's used in our particular passage of scripture this morning. Uh, the word world does not mean the, the entire world or all of creation. The same thing can be said with respect to John chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, wherein it says, For God so loved the world, and then that God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. In these passages of scripture, that is 2 Corinthians 5 and John 3. Uh, the word world uh, doesn't mean the entire world. And we've done this despite the fact that we have places in the Bible where Jesus clearly articulated why he came. Now we did this, we had done this in the past, and we continue to do this because our slave masters required it of us. And there are those who probably would say, well, there's no more slave masters today. Well, it depends on how you look at it. But one thing for sure, if you want to get your degree from the seminaries uh, in the Western world, you have to agree, or at least espouse, uh, the interpretation uh, that I have just related. But we have a clear understanding of what Jesus means, uh, or what Jesus, or why Jesus came, set forth in Matthew 15, 24, which reads, I am not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So Jesus did not come for all mankind, all creation. Then in Matthew 10, 5, and 6, we have these words. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. According to these scriptures, there can be no doubt then that Jesus lived and died for Israel. And though we have many passages in the New Testament where the term Gentiles is used, uh, I submit uh, that what is being said there is uh, a reference to Israelites 
who for one reason or another were no longer living in Israel, but had been scattered across the face of the earth. This is why Jesus said in Acts 1.8, uh, when he commissioned us, he said, uh, go uh, into Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the earth. He was sending uh, his disciples, his witnesses, to the places where the children of Israel had been relocated. When you look at the Old New Testament and, and you look at the places that Peter and Paul went, you will discover that they were visiting cities, setting up churches in places where there were large segments of Israelites. Not just the children of, Ju of Judah, but the children of Issachar, Nebulun, Zebulon, uh, Benjamin, and so forth, the children of Israel. Now, the English word for world in our text is a translation of the Hebrew word olam, O-L-A-M, which has to do with time, as in ages or epochs. It has nothing to do with the world as we understand and use the word world, nor does it have anything to do with creation. Now, world in our text, as we've said in 2 Corinthians 5 and John 3, does not mean all of creation. It means a specific group of mankind in a particular time. I'll say it again. It means a specific group of mankind in a particular time. Paul is using it here in our text to refer to the group of people from whom God has become separated. The group of people being referred to as the family of Jacob, the children of of Israel. Second Esdras 6 9 uses the word Olam when it says, For Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. In verse 17 of our text, Paul says, The old has gone, the new is here. So in Christ, God has fulfilled Second Esdras 6 9, meaning it's Jacob's world, it's Jacob's time. And now for our first covenant, the covenant of the Mar the uh, doctrine of the marital covenant with Israel. According to our scriptures, the only people with whom God has ever established a covenantal relationship is the family of Jacob or the children of Israel. God did this when he entered into a covenant of marriage with them at the foot of Mount Sinai. We find these words in Exodus 19, 5 and 6. Now, therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed and keep my command, covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and holy nation. Israel has been called to be a kingdom of priests. Well, they cannot have been a kingdom of priests to themselves or unto each other. No, they were called to be priests unto the other families and nations across the earth. First Peter 2.9 in the New Testament says it like this, But ye are a chosen generation, there, that epoch again, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praise of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Deuteronomy 32 9 says, For the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob is the lot of his inheritance. Again, clearly indicated. Israel has been specially called out by God from all the rest of humanity. We find these words in Isaiah 43, 1, which says, But now thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee. I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. We can see from these scriptures Israel is the only group of people with whom God 
has ever established a significant, indeed familiar bond, an everlasting bond. Zechariah 2.8 says, referring to Israel, well, he that touches you touches the apple of his eye. Israel is special to God, and it is Israel, not all of humanity throughout the world, that God has a covenant relationship. And it was to reconcile Israel with God that God sent Jesus into creation. Now for our second doctrine, the doctrine of the substitutionary atonement. A sermonic text of 2 Corinthians 5, 19 says that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All men have sinned, but through Christ, God erased. He forgave all men their sins. God wiped the slate clean. 2 Corinthians, 2, 14, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 says, One died for all, and therefore all died. In other words, sin entered through one man, Adam after which all mankind became subject to sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God's eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. The moment sin entered death, I'm sorry, the moment sin entered life, death came with it. Mankind died, for sin is separation from God. Sin, having entered life, was passed down from generation to generation. Romans 4, 24 through 25 says, uh, It shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses. But whereas sin is passed through the blood without consideration of intent, it is innate, that is, with respect to the benefit of eternal life through Christ. An intentional act is required. Let me go back to, to that again. Uh, under Adam, or through Adam, uh, the sin was passed down through the blood. Uh, but when it comes to Christ, we must engage in some intentional behavior uh, in order to become a new creature. It requires us to exercise faith it requires us to believe in God that he sent his son and that his son died for our sins. Romans 5, 18 says, So then just as one trespass brought condemnation for all men, so also one act of righteousness brought justification and life for all men. So just as Adam's sin, trespass, brought condemnation for all men. Jesus is, so oh Christ, death. He who knew no sin became sin. Christ, death, uh, one act of righteousness, dying for us, brought justification life for all men. For just as through the disobedience of the one man, Adam, the many were made sinners, so all through the obedience of the one man, Christ, many will be made righteous. Condemnation came through Adam originally, but now through Christ, justification has come. That is, innocence and life have come for men. Jesus paid it all in all to him we owe. On Calvary, Jesus atoned for our sins, your sins and mine. Just as Adam did, uh, just as what Adam did had impacted all of mankind until Christ. So that now that Christ has come, uh, what he has done impacts all those who desire to benefit, to receive the blessings of God through Christ. In Christ, God wiped the slate clean once and for all. He died for those who had come before him and for those who would come after him as well. Finally, we find these words in Romans 4.25. He who was delivered over because of our wrongdoings and was raised because of our justifications. Elsewhere in the scripture it says it like this. He who knew no sin became sin for us.
Christ died in our place. He died that we might live. Now for our third doctrine, the doctrine of justification. Because Jesus died once and for all, for the sins of all, henceforth all who accept Christ will be able to stand before God. Romans 8, 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation to men, to them rather, which are in Christ Jesus, who walk out not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. Because Jesus died, those who endeavored to serve God and keep his commandments had to go through priests. Uh, I'm sorry, before Jesus died, those who endeavored to serve God and keep his commandments had to go through priests. Uh, they had to engage in all kinds of sacrificial offerings in order to get the priest to speak to God in their behalf. Uh, then they were work walking according to the flesh. But after Christ, all of that was done away with because we now walk according to the Spirit. Romans 3.24 says, And all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. The shedding of Christ's blood covers us. It atones for our sins. It pays God for our sins. God gave this gift to us of His own volition. Romans 5, 9 says, Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. However, the wrath of God upon the world for our sins is still coming. But thank God for Jesus. Those who believe in Christ will not be subject to the wrath. For we are covered through Christ. Our sins have been forgiven through Christ. There are now no more charges against us. There is no more condemnation. The songwriter said it like this, Nothing between my soul and the Savior, so his blessed face may be seen. Nothing preventing the least of his favor. Keep the way clear, let nothing between. And finally, our fourth doctrine, the doctrine of reconciliation. Finally, we have the doctrine of reconciliation, and in that, the verb reconciling and the noun reconciliation, both of which appear in our text, connote or indicate a relationship between or amongst people or things. In our text, the Apostle Paul is saying that God, through Christ Jesus, reconciled, that is, removed or tore down the wall that has separated God from uh, his creation, and restored that relationship between himself and mankind to where it was in originally in the garden. So we now once and again approach God, or can approach God, and have fellowship with him, uh, wherever we may be, riding along in our car, sitting at home at the dinner table, in the movie theater, at the rec center. God, having torn down that wall through Jesus, has restored, has reconciled, has uh, once again made, given us access, direct access to him. Though we do have a mediator, it's not the kind of mediation uh, that was in the Old Testament where uh, no matter what you did or what you were trying to say or do, you had to go to a priest and uh, pay him and buy animals and give him money or whatever you need to do uh, materially uh, to get right with God. We're here now because Jesus has come. All we need to do is profess a believing faith in Jesus, that he's the Son of God and that God has raised him from the dead. And thereafter, we have access to God in any place, at any time, without any intervention need for intercession for anyone else. And notice this is a permanent and eternal reconciliation and restoration. Uh, Jesus told God in John 17, those that he had given him, he still had with the exception of that son of perdition. So once saved, always saved. There's no going back. 
now scriptural text. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. The Hebrew word here, used here, is kitso, which has to do with a wholly new creation. It's creation, not pro-creation. It is creation not being made from something that pre-existed, but being built up from the beginning, afresh, anew, from scratch. When God raised Jesus from the dead, God did a new thing. As has been said, the Hebrew word olim, which is translated as world, has to do with time, and more specifically with ages, epochs, dispensations, if you will. Our text is saying that God in this present age has reconciled himself uh, with his creation through Jesus Christ, the new creation. I do not know about you, but I do not like it when I fall out uh, with my loved ones, or with anyone, frankly. Uh, I don't like it. It doesn't feel right if, uh, if someone feels as though they have a beef with me. Now, there are times and some people uh, that you, you know, you just can't help, you just can't get along with. Uh, but uh, as much as it's possible within me, I like to live at peace with all men. Well, when God sent his son, God was saying, I'm going to take it upon myself right here and now with absolutely nothing uh, needing to be done on your part or on your behalf. To restore this relationship. After all, when you think about it, uh, when God created the original relationship between Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, uh, God did everything on his own. Uh, it was a one-way kind of thing. Uh, God told them he was going to bless them and their descendants. It wasn't anything that they had to do. So we have now, once again, God ultimately bringing about his promise to them through God taking that final initiative uh, when he sent his son into the world. Jesus said, no greater gift can a man give than to lay down his life for his friends. The songwriter said, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Jesus fixed it, and we can now go straight to God because of Jesus. Oh, what peace we often forfeit everything to God in prayer. In Christ, God reconciled the world to himself. I don't know about you, but I thank God for Jesus. Thank God that he so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. I thank God that he sent his son down through 40 and two generations, not according to my timing or to your timing, but according to his time. When it was time, he sent his son. His son came and walked and lived amongst us. And when it was time, his son made his way to Jerusalem. And when it was time, having arrived at Jerusalem, uh, they turned him over. Conducted all kinds of bogus trials, and ultimately, uh, having found him not guilty, and nevertheless, he was turned over to the mob. They marched him up Golgotha's hill, nailed him in his hands, and nailed him in his feet. He who had knew no sin, he who had done nothing wrong, uh, took on the sins of the world. They hung him on the cross. He hung there. He suffered. He bled and died. They took him down off the cross. He who had known no sin, he who had done no wrong, and buried him in a borrowed tomb. Uh, but early Sunday morning, having laid there all night Friday, all day Saturday, early Sunday morning, he got up from the grave. And he lives today. In Christ God did a new thing. God created a new man. And in this new man, Christ Jesus, God was reconciling the world to himself. God did it. It was through grace that we're saved, not of ourselves, but it's a gift of God. 
in Christ, God reconciled the world to himself. He tore down the partition, the barrier that had existed from the garden. And now it's been restored, and we can have direct communion with God. The door of the church is open. There may, man, may be a man, a boy, or girl, or woman, who has not yet professed a believing faith in Jesus, that he is the Son of God, and that God has raised him from the dead. Now is the time to come. Come by letter, come by Christian experience, come by baptism. Don't put it off. Don't delay. If you join together and sing him 376, Father Alone. Father Alone. Real. Come on. Know all about it. Come on. Father Alone. We will understand why. Sunshine. We will, we'll understand all oh, by and by. Sing it again, farther along, come on. Farther along. I see you, Beth Bellis. We will know all about it. Farther along, farther along. Just give yourself a little time, you can understand why. So cheer up. In Christ, God reconciled the world to himself. Hopefully there's been some thought in today's message that has touched your heart, that you may find encouraging, that you may want to share with others. Uh, we remind you of our Bible study and Thursday evening programs uh, that you may join in and share with us in fellowship. God uh, bless each and every one of you, and we'll now close out with singing him 297 following our benediction. Now unto him was able to keep you from falling and present you false before his presence with exceeding great joy to the only wise God our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, now and forever. Amen. <laughs>